Well, hi, I see you've joined me for another one of these insights. And uh, yeah, it's kind of special to have these kind of things. And thanks for joining me and looking at them. Let me turn on some more light here so that we can see what we're doing. I don't know whether that helps me shine brightly, but, uh, but it's good. In Genesis 12, we read that Abraham left Haran. And uh, God was calling him to Canaan. Now, his father had tried to set out for Canaan, but he got to Haran and stopped there, and we don't know why, but for whatever reason, Abraham didn't have the freedom, apparently, of going until Terah died. So the, uh, the book of Genesis, the writer of Genesis, is very clear that uh, Terah died, and then God says to Abraham, okay, leave your country and your people and go to a land I will show you. And we read in, in Genesis chapter 12 that Abraham left as the Lord told him. I want to focus some things about the journey of obedience because all of us are called to follow God, to go where he will show us. All of us are called to be obedient to him and to trust him like Abraham did. But there's a journey involved in getting to the promised land. And so I, I want to take some time with you just to walk through this and, and let's, let, let's think about some things. I want to say as a foundation to this that Abraham didn't earn God's grace, but he evidenced his faith through his obedience to God. That's critical. And because Abraham believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. It, it, won, it didn't become righteousness because he did something. He did something in obedience to God. Uh, <clears throat> it, and, and, and we sometimes think we don't have to do anything. Well, we don't do to earn, but we do out of love to express our faith and so on. So a journey of faith and obedience always begins with a departure. And then the destiny is not always uh, clear. God says to a place I will show you. So there's, there's a vagueness to that. But there are some commonalities to the journeys. Uh, look at these with me and let's just think about them. And I'll just kind of pick up each one separately. One of the commonalities is community. I just want to say, nobody comes out of Egypt alone. Nobody goes into the promised land alone. You always go in community. You know, it's kind of popular today to kind of be a Marlboro man, you know, all alone out there on, on your horse and, and uh, you believe God and I don't need anybody. No, it always in the Bible involves community. The second point is there are waypoints. There are specific places on the journey that we come to and things we do while we're there. Another one of the things that's common to the journey, whether it's yours or mine or Abraham's or somebody in between all of this, is worship. And worship is absolutely essential to the journey of obedience. Along the way, God will give us promise, and then he will assure us of his promise. The promises of God sometimes are a while in coming, but God is always true to his word and faithful to his promise. And the last one I want to talk about is his presence. God's presence will be evident at key times in the journey of obedience. So think about Abraham in a journey, but it's a journey of obedience that's going to have these five things. So <clears throat> the first thing we recognize is that Abraham left, but he left in community. So in chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, we read, And Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarah, at this point Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Now, the, the name Lot means veil or hidden. And so maybe there's, um, maybe there's something that we need to hear. So Lot's inclusion, while it is, involves community, this guy Lot is mentioned twice in the, in the first 
uh, <clears throat> in the early part of the chapter that Lot, he took Lot and Lot went with him, it says. And, and I wonder, Lot, veiled or hidden, and and the the number two, of course, is symbolic in in Hebrew and the Bible. It is symbolic, and it means a division or dividing. I wonder if Lot may have had ulterior motives in all of this. Yes, he wants to go with Abraham. Yes, he wants to see what God is going to reveal to him. But he also wants a little of the good life, the fast life, a little of doing it your own way. And, not missing out on the good stuff that Satan tempts us about. So this is probably tucked away in this, and I don't want to miss it. So Abraham's journey would be from one end of the promised land clear to the other. He walked from the very north end up there by Haran and wherever it starts, all the way down and ultimately into Egypt, and God's going to promise him the whole thing. So Abraham traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree Moray. Now there are a couple of trees mentioned here in, in these early chapters of Abraham, and it looks like that he found a tree to pitch his tent under the shade of, but this is the great tree Moray at Shechem specifically. And it says that at that time the Canaanites were in the land. So um, <clears throat> Noah has a grandson by the name of Canaan, and um, so we're going to see that these are his descendants, and they are inhabiting the land that God is going to give by covenant and promise to Abraham. So I've got a map up here, and it's got some colors, and uh, <clears throat> you may or may not be able to read. The brown is Egypt, of course, and, and the green is Goshen, the land of Goshen, to which all of the Hebrews, um, Jacob and all of his sons, are going to go to. The red is the land of Canaan that we're reading about right here. And then the pink is Padanaram up there at Haran where um, Abraham left. So it kind of gives you a glimpse of where, where we're talking about and where we're going. The route that Abraham takes is along the Spice Road. So the silk and the Spice Roads were well established and there would have been provisions along the way of water and food and so on that you could have picked up. So... <clears throat> Kind of like out here in the West, they had forts where, uh, and, and uh, trading centers that you could buy supplies in and maybe get your wagon wheel fixed. Now, <clears throat> I want to also say that there are waypoints along the way. And I'm going to talk about these as being extended campsites. It's not an overnight camp. It's um, maybe several months or several years. And one of them is at Shechem or sometimes in the Bible it's called Sichem. It means portion, it means shoulder, or it could mean she knows, and so uh, kind of hard to know, but we'll find it in the story as we go along. And this would be on a major travel route between the Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, and these two mountains are going to show up. So there are some ruins that have been excavated here, and it looks like, uh, sure enough, there, there were villages and cities from the Canaanite era in this area. So on the map, there's where we are. Shechem is quite a ways north of um, um, Jerusalem. Shechem, it's called. And uh, Sachar is the other town, twin city, at the twin hills of uh, um, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. And there is this mention of this great tree, Moray. More means teacher or oracle, and so uh, what in the world is it going to teach us, or what is it going to reveal or say? And it's on the road between Gerizim and Mount Ebal, and there is an ancient archaeological site, and I've got a picture of it here that's been excavated. So the Bible's correct in saying that the Canaanites lived there in those days, and we know that. Now, up to about, oh, I don't know, 40 or <clears throat> 30 or 40 years ago, this old tree was there, maybe as far back as 50 years, but but the stump and the tree was growing for a long time. Man, this is this is a 4,000-year-old tree. It finally died, and they have cut the stump down, and it's in a museum in Israel today, but, but it's thought that this is the great tree, Moray. Well, what about the tree? If you read some of the translations, it'll say that it was an oak tree. Now, probably not so. It's a, it's a terebinth tree, 
but it would have provided some shave, shade and a reprieve from the heat for Abraham, and so it would have been a very logical thing to pitch your tent in the shade of the tree, and your tent wouldn't get so hot out there in the desert area in the summertime. What I find is that this terebinth is actually a very practical tree, and it's got some symbolism and maybe a message for us. And uh, in the fall, this tree over in Israel uh, turns russet in color. And uh, actually, what we learn is that it's the pistachio tree, and that it's often mentioned in the Bible. There were pistachios that grew in that area. Matter of fact, um, <clears throat> It's, it, it has a mutuality that I'm going to talk about in just a little bit, but uh, the pagans thought it was kind of a goddess. Now, they, they liked the fruit. They found that the fruit was a superfood, and uh, it was very, very healthy, nourishing, and uh, delightful, actually. Matter of fact, Jacob instructed his sons to take some pistachios down to Egypt as a favor to the Egyptians from whom he was trying to get a favor to have some food so that he and his family could survive. Sometimes in our Bibles, the translations call them peanuts, but they weren't peanuts, they were pistachios. And this is a smaller version probably of the great tree. Now this would have been a great big tree. And there might have been shade for not only Abraham's tent, but, but several others around this uh, as the shade moved by through the days, each of them would have benefited a little of it. In Hebrew, the name of this tree is Elah, and that's the name of the valley where the David-Goliath story unfolds in the valley of Elah, so there must have been some pistachios over there. Now, I talked about a, a mutuality, and uh, it's kind of interesting. It's called the God Factor. Aphids uh, build their gall cradles all over the leaves of the pistachio tree, and uh, they create a stench. And the problem is that um, the goats and the other animals that come along and eat the leaves of the pistachio are repelled by the stench. And so the pistachio tree is protected by what looks like it's damaging the tree. And actually it's, um, it's a wholesome relationship. Now sometimes stuff comes along in our lives that attaches itself to something that we think is protection for us, but actually is, it isn't doing damage, it actually is somehow helping. And it's kind of interesting, I have a number of stories about how that happened in my, my life, and I'm sure you have some in your life as well. Another factor, another uh, thing of, that is a mutuality in uh, journeys of faith are, um, is, is worship. And this is the evidence of God's presence. So God speaks, not often, but he speaks, and he makes promises. So one of God's promises involves hope. To your offspring, I will give this land. Now, wait a minute. We were told that Abraham was 75 years old when he left Haran, and his wife was a year younger than him, so she would have been 74. Now, come on, everybody knows about biology, and uh, while a man may reproduce in, into his uh, old years, a woman stops ovulating at some point, and, and Sarah would have been beyond that. So biology would say, oh, we got a problem here. At 75 and 74, they don't have any children. And God comes along and says, to your offspring, I will give this land. Oh, wait a minute. Offspring? God, do you understand biology? I, I mean, you know, it would take a lot of faith to believe that God was going to somehow do something miraculously. And we could say, well, yeah, maybe Sarai was going to die and there would be another wife and maybe, oh, okay. That's not what God had in mind. Now, you and I cheat because we we know that nothing is impossible for God, and we've also read the rest of the story. But sometimes on our journey of faith, trusting God, we also have trouble believing that God is going to be able to bring about his promise. And so, come on, we're just like Abraham. This is true to life wherever you put it in time. 
Another waypoint is going to be, um, one of these extended campsites is going to be between Bethel and Ai. Now these are two very specific spots that come up. Bethel is the place where uh, Jacob had the dream, you know, he used a rock for a pillow. Ai was the first city that was conquered when the children of Israel came back and crossed the uh, the second, the second city that they con uh, conquered. Um, Ai means heap of room, ruins, and uh, Bethel means house of God. You know, it's kind of interesting that Abraham would camp between those two places. Now, let's just let's just get the words out here. He camped between the house of God and a heap of ruins. Uh, you know, that's an easy place to get stuck in. In my journey in life, I've sometimes been stuck between the house of God and a heap of ruins, and it seemed like everything was leaning toward the heap of ruins occasionally instead of to the house of God. But here's the story. So this campsite is just a little south of Shechem, about 31 miles, so he had probably grazed everything off in the area of Shechem under the terebinth tree, pistachio tree, and had moved a little bit south where there would have been some more good grazing. He had a lot of sheep, a lot of donkeys, camels, some oxen. He had a lot of a lot of critters to feed. And so here's an artist's conception of what one of these towns uh, might have looked like back then. I, I know they didn't have any cameras, so they couldn't take a picture that you and I could enjoy, but the artist thought he knew what it looks like, and here it is. Isn't that fun? And there's a map, and uh, you can see up in the upper left-hand corner, Bethel and Ai aren't too far apart. Somewhere in between there is where Abraham pitched his tent and stayed for a while. And these towns are going to float through the stories of Abraham, Jacob, Samuel, Saul, David. And, and uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of connection to these places that appear early back here in Genesis. Another thing that I see as a... Um, commonality and a journey of faith is the assurance of God's presence. You see, the God of the Bible is available. And so Abraham often builds an altar, and it tells, says again that there he built an altar and called on the name of the Lord. This is worship, and worship takes some initiative. It can take place anywhere, but like Abraham, you and I have to take some initiative in worshiping. We have to find a place, and there needs to be sacred space. All religions have sacred space, and Abraham sanctifies a place by building an altar and making a sacrifice to God. God, the God who called him on this journey, speaks but not frequently. It seems that months and sometimes years go by between the times that God gives clear instruction. You and I also need to hear from God, but sometimes God is silent for a long time. I, I've had a pilot's license and flown airplanes, and one time I was coming back into Spokane from down south in Idaho, and. I, I ran into some clouds, and the clouds got denser and denser, and I finally radioed the um, approach control and told them I was inbound and I wanted to go to Fells Field in Spokane, and so they made radar contact and, uh, and assured me that I, they, had, they had me, uh, they knew where I was. And that means that they would be watching out for all the airplanes I couldn't see in the clouds, and Pretty soon I radioed back and said, I've lost ground contact and I'm, I'm a visual, I'm, I'm operating on visual rules. And the story is that if you're a visual pilot, it takes about five minutes for you to bore a hole in somebody's backyard or farm and embarrass yourself. And I didn't want to do that. So I radioed back to the approach control and I said, I've lost ground contact now. And he said, Roger, and uh, my call numbers, he said, uh, Fels Field is at one o'clock, so I made an adjustment, and now I'm in I'm in dense fog. I can't see anything. I made an adjustment to a heading of what he called one o'clock, and uh, and I, 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 I called back and I said, now I can't see the ground. I don't have any reference to the ground. I'm flying I'm flying on instruments. He said, uh, Roger, maintain straight and level. Face uh, Fels Field is at one o'clock, and uh, straight ahead now. And uh, 
the the fog clears uh, just north of the freeway. <laughs> well, I had a passenger with me, and he said, "Man, let's turn around, and go back." And I said, "Well, that's where you kill yourself. It's when you try to do something. We need to stay on the instructions that he gave us." And so we had to just fly. And I'm telling you what, it seemed like a long time. It wasn't very long, but it seemed like a long time. Flying in the clouds, not being able to see anything, just trusting the instructions that were given to us. And sure enough, just north of the freeway, everything cleared up. And there was Phelps Field right in front of us. And I was able to call the tower and land safely and uh, wipe the sweat off my brow and all that good stuff. I think that this story is assuring you and me on our journey that it's important for us to maintain the relationship with God. And worship is one of the ways that we do that. God speaking is one of the ways that he does that. Also his blessing along the way and his protection are critical, but we need to be involved in maintaining the relationship with God. I find that most people tend to prefer results rather than relationship. In other words, when we pray, we're really interested in what God can do for us rather than enjoying who he is as he walks with us. And so almost always prayer requests involve asking God to do something, to change the circumstances or to give them something, rather than just the thanksgiving of enjoying his presence and his protection and his blessing along the way. Uh, let's, let's learn that little lesson. It's important. Another waypoint in, his, in Abraham's journey is to the wilderness. And so we read that he went to the wilderness, the Negev. And Negev means, uh, could mean Southland. It also means uh, uh, to dry, to wipe dry. And so in chapter 12, we have Abraham journeying from the north all the way down south to the Sinai Pelin Peninsula. And God had said that he was going to take him to a land he would show him. So what the story is showing us, that as Abraham goes from the north to the southern border of the land, he walks it, he sees it, he lives in it, he worships in it. He is getting to know the land that God ultimately is going to give him. At this point, he is what you and I would call a nomad. Over there, they talk about Bedouins. They live in tents and they move periodically from place to place. The term Bedouin is Arab, Arabic, and um, th there's a Hebrew word like it that simply means desert dweller. So Abraham becomes a desert dweller here. Now, back in the first verse of this chapter 12 of Genesis, God has said, I will show you. And he has been faithful in showing Abraham the land in all of its differences, and it does. Israel has lots of differences. It had mountains, and it has uh, flatland and valleys. It has dry places, and it has uh, well-irrigated places along the Jordan River. So in Abraham, God had found a man. Now, I don't think that he just happened on him. I, I think that God knows what's happening in the future, but God had a man that he could trust and he could use. He could bless, and he could bless all the nations through him. The interesting thing is that Abraham listened, and he heard God. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but you see, God is spirit, and we're, we're designed to hear physical sounds, sound waves, we call them. But God doesn't use sound waves because he's not physical. He doesn't have vocal cords, and he doesn't have an eardrum, but he does communicate with us clearly. The problem is that as humans, we don't hear in the spirit world very well, but there are occasionally people in the Bible who hear God, and Abraham is one of those, and he not only heard, but in the Bible, hearing and obeying are the, are the same word in Hebrew, so Abraham obeyed God because he heard him. So he left Haran, and he headed out to where God was going to show him. Along the way, and in all this story, he trusts God, 
and then he sees all that God is going to show him. Now, there's lots of things that God is going to show him. This is just the land at this point. There's going to be more. And Abraham worshiped God and kept the relationship alive. You see, God had a man through whom he could bless the nations now whether in Egypt or whether the Canaanites or the Philistines, and there's going to be a whole bunch of people groups that are going to flow through the story, and God wants to bless all of them. Now, not everyone has their cup right side up so that God, God's, they can, they can uh, receive and retain God's blessing. Some have their cup upside down, and God lets his rain fall on the just and the unjust alike. But you've got to have your cup right side up in order to receive the blessing that God pours out. In the process of all of this, Abram would enjoy God's blessing. And it isn't just the increase of sheep and camels and children and all of that. It's, it's health. It's honor. It's relationships. There's a whole bunch of stuff. If you and I do not go where God wants to show us, and if we don't trust him in all of life's journey, we miss the blessing and the honor that only he can give us. What a story. And it's all tucked away in this 12th chapter of the book of Genesis. Now, I've got some other things that I do, and I've shared with you here. I've got a, a, a blog, a daily, uh, not a daily devotional, but three times a week. I, I do meditating with Ron, and I kind of dig out little gems along the way. You can find them at meditatingwithron.com. I have some books that I've written that uh, where I focus on. I got, got into this Old Testament uh, insights, and when I realized that the Bible isn't just a history book, it's a revelation. And as I began to see these, I began to write some of them down. Got some of them in a book called um, Delightful Insights. And then I've got one with a bunch of missionary stories, the God, the God moments uh, in mission, short mission trips. And it's fun. And it's called Into the Harvest because we can participate with God in the harvest today. And uh, sometimes going somewhere where God is working is just a thrill. And if you like one of those books, if you'll contact me, I'll be glad to get it to you. You can email email me at Dr. Dr. Ron Hunter, Dr. Ron Hunter at gmail.com, and I'll be glad to send you a book if you if you'd like to have one. Thanks for joining me today, and thanks for uh, thanks for hearing the insight. Now let's live it out, you and me. Okay, God bless you.